Hello and welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are doing a story about Ambarish. Ambarish was a king who did something many other kings were unable to. He humiliated Durvas. You probably know of Durvas from a bunch of stories we have done before. And if you do, you'll know that putting durvas in trouble is nearly impossible but ambarish was able to do that thanks to a very special gift from a very special god ambarish was a capable king he ruled his kingdom fairly passed judgment wisely was tough on the lawbreakers and was generous to those who did good so He was an all-around good guy. Ambarish was also a devotee of Vishnu. Now, if you have heard earlier episodes of this show, you'll know that Vishnu is the preserver of the universe. He creates a kind of balance between Brahma, the creator, and Shiva, the destroyer. A bit of a shameless plug here, but Brahma is also my dad so yeah i'm pretty famous myself in the who's who of indian mythology anyway ambarish was quite a devotee of vishnu and often prayed to him in fact every month he would fast an entire day to make his prayers more successful don't ask me why fasting and prayers are necessary for regular humans to be able to see vishnu for me if i want to see vishnu or for that matter shiva or brahma i just show up at their doorstep besides having complete knowledge of the past present and future i can also travel anywhere in space and time kind of like the doctor from doctor who but i don't need a spaceship disguised like a police call box after a combination prayer and fast that ambarish performed vishnu appeared himself in person ambarish was delighted but he did not forget protocol he bowed before vishnu and vishnu was quite pleased by ambarish's devotion I must say that I got a little jealous of Ambrish at this point. You may know from previous episodes that I am rather devoted to Vishnu myself. I am also president for life of Vishnu's fan club. So you might be able to understand why I feel just a teensy bit jealous when Vishnu looks favorably upon others. Vishnu granted ambrish a boon the king would get personal protection from vishnu's own sudarshan chakra the sudarshan chakra is a flying disc that spins around vishnu's finger it's a very sharp disc that can slice and dice anything even diamonds which are the hardest material known to people wouldn't stand a chance against the sudarshan chakra The protection of the Sudarshan Chakra was practically guaranteeing that Ambarish could not be hurt physically. It was a good gift for a king to have. A king keen on warfare might have loved it. But Ambarish was observing peace at the time. No chances of him getting drunk on the power of the Sudarshan Chakra. Besides, the Sudarshan Chakra's protection 
could be used in defense, not offense. Except if you were Vishnu. Vishnu, of course, could use the Sudarshan Chakra any way he pleased. The king thanked Vishnu and Vishnu departed. But that didn't mean that Ambarish stopped praying. The king continued to be just as devoted to Vishnu as he was before. He continued to fast and he continued to pray to Vishnu every month. Some of his ministers were puzzled. Vishnu had appeared and he had granted Ambarish something. What more did the king want? To which the king patiently replied that praying to Vishnu wasn't a one-time thing. Getting a boon wasn't Ambarish's goal. Ambarish needed to continue praying and fasting so that he could keep the people in his kingdom rich and happy. At one such fast, a few months later, Ambarish had an unexpected visitor. It was the Rishi Durvas. If you have heard previous episodes featuring Durvas, you know that Durvas is not the kind of person whom you want to have visit you in your home. Imagine the worst kind of spoiled brat behavior. And imagine that the spoiled brat also has practically unlimited power. So take someone like Dudley Dursley, Harry Potter's cousin, if you have read the Harry Potter series. And if you imagine that Dudley had Voldemort's powers, you'd get somebody like Durvas. Durvas had cursed Indra for something simple. And that ended up with the grandest experiment ever, with the Devs having to extract nectar from an ocean of milk. That churning of the ocean also led to a lot of other incidents. All of that energy expended just because Durvas felt a little offended. Durvas arrived on the scene just as Ambarish and his advisors were ready to break their fast. The king put down the bit of rice he had picked up and greeted Durvas politely. The king remained calm, even though his advisors were nervous wrecks. They all had heard Durvasa's stories. And being in positions that lacked power made the advisors feel even more vulnerable. What if Durvas didn't like the color of the clothes they wore? Or what if he decided to curse them because they had seemed too cheerful? But Durvas didn't pay them any attention. He addressed the king. Ambarish, I will do you the honor of joining in your meal. But before eating, I must bathe. I will bathe and come back. Do not get started without me. Given a direct command like that, Ambarish had to agree. It's not just because of Durvasa's reputation. It was the king's duty to obey the whims and fancies of every guest. A guest should be treated like God, his guideline said. And this is something that continues to this day in Indian culture. Durvas was certainly a guest who abused this guideline. But that didn't matter to Ambarish, who just wanted to do the right thing. There was a specific time range that the fast had to be broken in for it to have maximum effect. Otherwise, their efforts would have been wasted. This narrow window of auspiciousness was crucial. Ambarish and his advisors were already very hungry and thirsty. If Durvas had appeared even a second later than he did, the fast would have already been broken. But now, they had to look at and smell the delicious food that was so tantalizingly within their grasp. And yet, 
so far out of reach. They waited and waited for hours. Do you think he got lost on the way to the river? Asked one advisor, who was literally salivating with his eyes fixed on the laddus. Amrish calmly said that Durvas couldn't have lost his way. The administration had just put up some new signposts there. Maybe he changed his mind, said another advisor, hopefully. Unlikely, Amrish responded. Most likely, he's picked some longer-than-usual mantras to chant during his bath today. Finally, one of the priests tried a different tactic. You know, your auspicious time window is passing quickly. What if we all had a sip of water? Just a sip. Even if Durvas is late, we'll have kept him happy and we'll have broken the fast from the window of auspiciousness point of view. One of Ambrish's advisors chimed in at this point. Yes. You will still be eating a meal with Durvas. You can just have a sip of water now. Water should be fine. Humans are 70% water, basically. And it's no different from if it had rained. Your body would have absorbed some water from the rain anyway. And no one would have held that against you. The royal librarian had been studying the royal book of ethics edition 6, and finally lowered his glasses and said, I have to agree. According to chapter 7, a host may consume water without consultation with or permission of the guest if the host is thirsty and if the guest is not present to object to said water consumption. There may be some updates in edition 7, I believe. But edition 7 only came out last week, and I don't have a copy of it. Convinced by these arguments, Ambarish took just a single sip of water in the dying seconds of the auspicious time window and immediately stopped. Because a voice thundered, Ambarish, how dare you? It was the Vas. Were you hiding behind a bush just now? Asked the surprised king. Never mind what I did, Durvas said. What did you do, Ambrish? You swore you'd participate in a meal with me. But it was just a drop of water. And I'm made of water. So it's no different than if it rained and if my body absorbed it naturally. The king protested. Nonsense, said Durvas. You should carry an umbrella when it rains, so you don't accidentally break your fast. Everyone whom I've talked to about this knows that. Everyone knows that now, thought Ambrish. But I bet they didn't before you curse them. Aloud, he said, And the Royal Book of Ethics specifically prohibits it interrupted Durvas. I, myself, wrote edition 7. But enough quibbling over little details. It's clear that you have committed a crime and you must be punished. With that, Durvas plucked a hair from his eyebrow. Ambrish and his ministers wondered why the Rishi was punishing himself by plucking his own hair forcefully. But they understood when Durvas threw the hair towards Ambarish and it transformed into a gigantic monster. The monster stepped forth, grinning an evil grin that showed its long, sharp teeth. It made straight for Ambarish and it was clear the monster intended to eat the king up. Ambarish's soldiers sprung into action by running away. They hightailed it, abandoning their king because the monster was just that terrifying. And they knew 
that the king didn't stand a chance. That's where they were wrong. Because right before the monster's sharp claws could sink into the king, something shiny zoomed into view. It was the Sudarshan Chakra. It moved quickly and sliced off the monster's arms before then decapitating the monster itself. But it didn't stop there. The Sudarshan Chakra had an internal threat detection system and that threat detection system had determined that the monster originated from Durvasa's hair. And Durvas had quite a bit of hair left. So the Sudarshan Chakra headed for the Rishi next. It only wanted to give him a shave. But you can imagine how Durvas misunderstood its intentions. Durvas ran from the scene. Thankfully, besides his superpower of cursing, he also could travel fast. Not enough to leave the Sudarshan Chakra far behind, but enough to keep it at a constant distance at least. He couldn't stop to rest or breathe even. Otherwise, the Sudarshan Chakra would catch up and probably do to him what he had intended his monster to do to Ambarish. Durvas, being a prominent Rishi, had the equivalent of speed dial to most of the who's who of gods and goddesses in Indian mythology. First, he called Brahma. Because Brahma is usually the easiest to convince. If you have heard earlier episodes, you'll know how generous Brahma is. Even when granting superpowers to hardened criminals and mega villains. Coincidentally, just then I was visiting my dad, Brahma. That's when the call from Durvas came in. I didn't eavesdrop. At least I didn't mean to. But then, I already have complete knowledge of everything. So I figured, I wasn't causing any harm, you know. Durvas asked for ideas to stop the Sudarshan Chakra. Like, could Brahma, the creator, create a wall around this menacing disk? You know, walls are not going to work. My dad told him, Well, what if you create an antimatter Sudarshan Chakra that can annihilate this Sudarshan Chakra? Durvas suggested. My dad replied that he felt Durvas was really clutching at straws here. An antimatter Sudarshan Chakra would not be stable enough. It's just going to disintegrate in this matter-dominated universe of ours. Why don't you try Shiva instead? He can destroy the universe, can't he? So, he can probably destroy the Sudarshan Chakra. But Shiva's answer was a no. Not that he couldn't destroy the disk, but that it was Vishnu's property. I mean... What if Vishnu were to just walk up and destroy my bow or my trident? How would I feel? Durvas protested that Vishnu did destroy Shiva's bow. His avatar, Ram, did that in episode 16, 16 Flags. That's not what I meant, Shiva clarified. That was an old, unused bow. No. I think it's best if you talk to Vishnu himself. It was Vishnu's own Sudarshan Chakra. So surely, this meant Vishnu knew the abort codes and could stop it chasing Durvas. But Vishnu said that he wouldn't. He said it was only up to the one person whom the Chakra was protecting. But that's so risky. You don't have any kill switches? Durvas asked. That's a bad choice of words, but I get what you mean, Vishnu replied. And no, I can't let you wiggle out of this. 
you will need to talk to Ambarish directly. Reluctantly, but still speedily, Durvas reached Ambarish again. And this time, he fell at the king's feet and apologized. Ambarish was magnanimous in his possession. He prayed and immediately the Sudarshan Chakra went off. Durvas and Ambarish made peace that day and they did break their fast together. But if you thought that this incident changed Durvas, you'd be completely wrong. That's where we'll end it this time. A few notes on the show. We have mentioned the Sudarshan Chakra before in episode 121.5, our two-year anniversary special. And the Sudarshan Chakra was also briefly mentioned in episode 36, Jagannath. Durvas has featured in a few episodes before. Besides episode 105 and episode 37, he also caused the events that led to the churning of the ocean, something we covered in episode 51, 52 and 53. The one time that Durvas did anything useful was when a trick that he showed Kunti allowed her to have the Pandav children. That was in episode 115. In the next episode, we'll do a folk tale from Bengal about devotion and faith. The faith of a schoolboy and his mother in someone who appears to be an ordinary cowherd at first, but soon it becomes apparent that he is much more than that. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are any particular stories that you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.